Would you like me to stop share? No, you're good, Lorraine. Okay. Hi, everyone. We're going to get started in just a minute. I'm going to let everybody log on. Hello, and welcome to one of today's Tiger Alumni Week webinars, Wine About It Alumni Style. I am Rupa Thind, Associate Director of the Simone Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at RIT, and your moderator this evening. Before I introduce our speaker, there are a few housekeeping points I want to go over. All attendees have joined in mute mode. However, your questions can be answered in the Q&A box at any time throughout the discussion. We will make every effort to address all of your comments and questions throughout the webinar. This webinar will be recorded and made available in the upcoming weeks. A communication with how to access the recordings will be sent out and also posted on our website. If you have any technical issues, please feel free to type those into the chat box as well, and we will do our best to get you the appropriate answers. We would like to thank our premier sponsor, Sharp Notions, as well as our Tiger sponsor, Rochester Regional Health, for helping make this week's programming possible. We also would like to thank our Access Services teams for helping us make this webinar accessible for all of our alumni. Real-time captioning is available within the webinar and our interpreters will be spotlighted during the presentation. The pandemic has had a major impact on everyone, including our students. We thank all of our alumni and friends for the support you have given to our students during these uncertain times. If you are interested in supporting or continuing your support, make sure to mark your calendars for this year's Roar Day, which will be held tomorrow. We, have, we will have giving challenges, an alumni scavenger hunt, and more. So please consider making a gift to support students who need it now more than ever. Can't wait for Roar Day? You can make a gift right now by visiting rit.edu backslash Roar and your gift will be counted towards the Roar Day total and help RIT achieve its $1.5 million goal. Now on to our session. We are pleased to welcome Lorraine Hems as she talks about her favorite topic, wine. After years in the wine industry, Lorraine Hems started teaching a wine course part-time at RIT in 2001 and became a full-time lecturer in 2005. She received a BS degree in social work from Nazareth College and her master's from RIT in service leadership and innovation in 2012. Lorraine is a certified sommelier with the Court of Master Sommeliers, Certified Wine Educator, and Certified Specialist of Spirits through the Society of Wine Educators, a Certified Wine Judge through the American Wine Society, and now an instructor in their judge certification program. After attaining the Wine and Spirit Education Trust Level 3, she started teaching WSET. Wow. Lorraine helped start the local chapter of Women for Wine Sense, and received their Lifetime Achievement Award in 2012. For the promotion of and education about the wines of New York, she received the New York Wine and Grape Foundation's Consumer Award in 2016 and has served as head judge at their New York Wine Classic and the Finger Lakes International Wine Competition. And I could go on and on about her many accolades. I feel extremely um, unqualified next to her. So Lorraine, thank you for joining us and the audience is all yours. Wonderful. Well, I don't know, after that long introduction, I don't know, does anyone, anyone have all seven wines poured or, uh, well, even if you don't have the wines in front of you uh, or all of them from alums, a lot of these alums will be looking forward to seeing you maybe purchase in the future. And I, I'm here to make you aware uh, how to wine about it alumni style and get you into knowing where some of your former classmates are and what they're up to. So uh, tonight's wine tour. Uh, that's what I love doing. I love giving wine tours. And so basically don't wait for me. If you have wine in front of you, please pour it, taste it as we go along. Uh, because I'm going to give you a little bit of basics, but also I'm going to take it coast to coast with a lot of different wines and then urge you to explore others. And pick my brain, even if we don't get to some of your questions tonight. So uh, the good news is hospitality program that some of you may have, may have been in or 
at least have taken the wine courses from me and maybe it didn't. Uh, that's back at the College of Business after years away from it. And so we're very happy to be there. And we have tonight joining us alums from coast to coast and alums that have worked both hemispheres uh, with harvests and making wine and even our former students joining us. So hello to anyone who took a class from me, but also uh, to those who escaped without taking my class. Um, I wanna do a shout out to alum and lecturer Deborah Myberg. Uh, she was the first recipient of the Master of Wine title in Asia. And she's the one who recommended me for this position. So when she was teaching ahead of me and said, well, I'm heading back to Hong Kong. I said, good luck with your studies, but uh, thank you very much. I'd like to start teaching and I love what I do. And hopefully that comes across. So um, many of you received maybe a little too late to go out and buy some of these wines, uh, this list of wines with all these super seven grapes that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, I did not include sparkling point in the tasting tonight because as the name sounds, there are sparkling wines there, but uh, only sparkling wines there. And Melissa Schwartz Rockwell is there. And uh, so I put her contact info at the end. And then many of you are familiar with Casa Larga Vineyards. Their founder, Andy Colorotolo, uh, was, was um, a graduate of RIT and this wonderful winery out in Fairport that's been so supportive of hiring some of our students and also uh, being very good to us. In fact, some of you might even remember that we had an RIT wine made by them at one point. So I wanted to give a shout out to those, even if I'm not including those specifically in the list of wines, you will have that list to be able to purchase wines later. So if I've missed anyone in the industry that you know of, please let me know. I don't want to exclude you. And yes, I'd love to use your wines in the future, but have fun, ask questions, and now on to the Super 7. There's so many ways we could have done this thing tonight, but um, as was mentioned, I have worked with the WSET for a while now, and I feel it's really a basis for learning more about wine and obtaining certifications. And I just had a lab assistant today, Emma had asked, well, how'd you get into it? And what do you think about these certifications? And I think this is so good uh, of an organization that uh, started in the UK back in 69, and now you have over half a million individuals completing the qualifications, 70 countries, 20 different languages, and uh, different levels. I, I went up to level three, started uh, four, and I'm permanently stalled maybe at that. But it could be a stepping stone to the Master of Wine, like Deborah Myberg. So I've taken some of their materials, modified them slightly, just to give you some basis, some basic ideas, because a lot of us start out maybe with people telling us things, and you don't always know if they're true or not, but there's some good basics for understanding why maybe these two coasts that we're representing tonight have such diversity. And then again, I'd love to know if we had some other alums in between our coasts, but uh, a grape, when we talk about wine, we talk about agriculture. And that's something that escaped me, believe it or not, for years. I never really thought about it as starting in the vineyard. You hear this sort of ground to glass, but you don't necessarily think about grapes growing. You think about, I go in, I buy a bottle of wine, I drink it with my friends and everything's uh, interesting. If you really want to explore wine more, you can do that. But a grape needs sunlight and heat, basics to really grow well. And so there's this little, uh, sort of graph here talking about trying to figure out that balance, that sugar levels increasing and acid levels before they start to drop out before harvest, trying to hit that, I don't want to say sweet spot, but that balance spot that we're all looking for when we try wines. And as grapes ripen, they swell with water, the sugar levels rise up, rise up, any Hamilton fans? And at some point, acid levels will start to fall. And so I tease my students that uh, these grapes are kind of naughty and dropping acid in the vineyard as sugar is increasing. But it's very important to remember we're looking for a balance for our grapes not to get so ripe that then we lose that acid to help balance. Flavors, hey, this is a WSET. See that U stuck in there? So our flavors become riper the longer they hang on that vine. And their red grape skins will change color otherwise you look out in the vineyard and it's like all green grapes wherever you look um, until right before harvest when they start to change color. So agriculture, please don't forget it. 
We can't grow certain grapes well in certain climates, and that's why we'll emphasize some things a little differently on both of the coasts or in other countries, you'll hear, that these differences really add up. So where the grapes grow, we, if anyone <laughs> remembers attending RIT, we're a continental climate. We're stuck right in the continent, and we have some influence from Finger Lakes in our area or further south along Long Island. There's water that helps moderate temperatures, but we're still a cooler climate region up here, and that's where we see those extremes in temperatures during the seasons. So that affects how all plants, not just grapes grow, but our grapes tend to be lower in sugar. So that's less potential alcohol. So maybe a little bit lighter body. And then grapes that are naturally higher in acid, which I really love with uh, foods. And if we think about what grows together, goes together, there's some natural affinities in all of these areas for what wines go with certain foods. And then if we talk about globally, Northern France, Champagne, Chablis, uh, those are cooler climate areas. Germany, the southwest portion, yes, there's beer there too. I know there's some beer lovers here, but um, in Germany, it's most of the production to the southwest. Uh, so cooler climate and the grapes won't get as ripe, but the acid will be nice and high. So warmer climates, we're going to see what they would call globally black grapes or red grapes is how we usually refer to them. They're going to be higher in sugar because of the longer growing season, potentially more alcohol. And then grapes tend to be a little lower acid and so a little uh, richer, maybe jammier, riper flavors. And classic examples would be parts of California, parts of Australia. They're such big countries or states that you can't just generalize and say all of California or all of Australia. But the further away you get from the coast and those moderating uh, bodies of water, that's where we're going to see our hotter areas. So the Super 7, what are the Super 7? And again, I encourage you to explore and we can get so locked into, oh, this is my favorite or this is my favorite, but then going out and exploring things that you can find new favorites or uh, be able to talk to other people to explain maybe some of the nuances and exploration of these different grapes you may never have heard before. So our big seven, and you can debate this, uh, but usually the big seven would include Riesling and the Finger Lakes are known internationally for this grape and what's so beautiful about it is it can go from dry all the way to ice wine sweetness. Sauvignon Blanc we'll see on both coasts, uh, but again, different styles and then Chardonnay, wow, there's a grape that grows everywhere and uh, cool, moderate, hot climates and all of the different styles that those climates will have that impact on that grape, on that wine. Um, Pinot Noir. So if you have Pinot Noir in your glass and you have some of these other reds, you're gonna see a big color difference. Pinot Noir is our diva grape and it'll be very, very different styles from both coasts. Um, Merlot, we see mostly West Coast and Long Island. Long Island being further South has more of a maritime climate. And with a couple extra weeks of growing time, they can really do Merlot and some of these other grapes following uh, a little bit better than what we'll see in the Finger Lakes. Syrah, it, it, that does like a warmer climate in general. We do see a little Syrah in the Finger Lakes and uh, I love a big Syrah and I have ordered some for tonight's tasting from the West Coast as well. But Cabernet Sauvignon, it's sort of like the beef, it's what's for dinner and Cabernet Sauvignon is that big thick skinned, big red that will go with some of our fattier foods, some of our richer foods until maybe a little bit of aging. It has great aging potential. But we see that longer growing season on, on the West Coast and uh, found down in Long Island as well. And some of the blends of these uh, red grapes in particular. So over 10,000 different grapes around the world. We don't have all night, do we? So moving right along. I love these slides. You'll have access to these. Was there um, uh, Riesling, but I talked before about how great the Finger Lakes are and and what international recognition we've received for that. Uh, international and in Europe and Australia. Uh, this is a naturally high acid grape that can go all of those different sweetness levels. And so we might see more tart green apple, lime, uh, floral moving into peach, stone fruit, and even tropical fruit when it gets a lot sweeter. So we tend to think about Germany but you have to throw Finger Lakes in there uh, because of the reputation. 
And there's a few other countries we might see it from. Sauvignon Blanc, the savage white. Uh, that's also going to be high acid. And we'll usually see it in a dry style. Uh, certainly apple, and I'll tell my students green apple for a default answer, and that lemon. And then it gets into these green things. For me, Sauvignon Blanc is a G grape. And so you'll see green bell pepper and maybe green lime, gooseberry. Not that many people have had that particular fruit, but that's a classic descriptor. And then even sort of vegetal asparagus. And this was one of the parents for uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. So it will have a little bit of that greenness that you might also see in Cabernet Sauvignon. Chardonnay, oops, I'm sorry. Sancerre and New Zealand, New Zealand style is probably the most popular style that people see, but I don't have any alums down there that I know of right now. So I'm gonna go another direction. Chardonnay, as I mentioned, grows in all climates and depending on a cooler climate, the acidity will be a little higher, but warmer climates where we move out of apple and lemon and go into pineapple and peach. And this is the first grape we'll really start talking about for a green grape, the use of oak, uh, especially in the warmer climates, you can, um, you can get bolder flavors that can stand up to bolder oak um, influence. So you can see a lot of different textural differences with uh, the different climates for this Chardonnay grape, pineapple, peach, and then you see some of the regions globally. Pinot Noir, that's my thin skin grape. So you're going to find it preferring a little bit cooler climate and you're going to see red fruit. So the color tends to be a little bit lighter, the, the body tends to be a little bit lighter. It's not going to have as much of this this thing we talk about tannin, mouth drying sort of grittiness in the mouth. And we're going to see more of that red fruit, cherry, strawberry, cranberry, um, and then maybe some oak. But we might see the oak not as bold as maybe for some of these other grapes coming up. And there we see red burgundy all bow to the great. Oh, okay. We'll talk domestic tonight and a few other areas. And then there's uh, the mention of champagne. And so I did want to mention Sparkling Point because they will use Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and many of their sparklings, which are traditional in champagne. Merlot, my M grape, my Goldilocks grape. Who doesn't love a little Merlot? Because it's not to this and it's not to that. It's just right. But it seems to be in between Pinot Noir and Cabernet Sauvignon as far as its, its flavor. So its fruit could be red, its fruit could be darker. Uh, plum is a key descriptor for it. And you might also see oak and you'll see this grape around the world. Uh, sometimes you won't even know that it's in certain blends, but it, it's around. And again, you'll see a little bit lower maybe on the acid, a little bit lower maybe on the tannin until we get to Cabernet Sauvignon. But I'm gonna make another stop first. We're going to talk about those areas and then Syrah or what most people are familiar with these days from Australia, Shiraz. Or as they said when we were down there, I bet Shiraz they're good. I don't know. Can we get that translated? Okay. Um, blackberry, black pepper, uh, that, that really spicy quality to it. And again, depending on the climate, you could have a little bit less acidity and also more tannin. But a lot of the tannin might be held, might, might be blocked by the richness of the fruit. So another grape, and certainly areas of the world that uh, we can explore. Cabernet Sauvignon, big, bold on the left, and there's our green qualities that I had mentioned with Sauvignon Blanc, um, and then maybe minty, uh, black currants, and then that vanilla for uh, from the oak again. So many characteristics, but just listing some of the basics. Uh, from the WSET that give you an idea of what to look for, but also expectations as far as how it feels in the mouth, how uh, the components are. So just wanted to run through those before we got to trying something. And uh, as we go along, we'll have some questions and I know you're gonna wonder who that is. So I'm gonna go back up to uh, all the way up here to Riesling. Cheers. So I've got, I've got different glasses here tonight. I don't know. But when I'm smelling my Riesling, this is a young white glass. It flares out a little bit. I always look for that floral part. 
and um, it, it just keeps it interesting. We have that. I'm not the best at sniffing flowers. It's probably good. My neighbors would be a little um, uh, shocked if I started sniffing theirs, but you can always train your brain better. So sniff your spice cabinet, whatever all else you want to sniff. But the floral, and I've got several Rieslings in front of me tonight. Uh, I don't know how many of you have uh, preservers, but there's a couple different preservers out there that allow you to open a few different bottles and then not consume all of it in one sitting and then go back and try them a little bit later. And the, the big one right now is Coravin, uh, but there are others that once the bottle is open, the cork is out or the screw cap's undone, uh, you can put something on to either pump air out or put a little bit of a, a argon or um, gas on top, that blanket that will protect it from air. So this Riesling, How many of you are drinking Riesling? I hope you are because that can set your whole appetite up for so much. There's acidity is mouth watering. So I love the Finger Lakes Rieslings in particular. There aren't as many in California, but I've had some very good ones. Um, Klein, uh, the Aaron Horn Klein, uh, their wine company, three wine company, they do a Riesling uh, late harvest, I believe. And there's, there are others out there that usually a little bit cooler areas they can get good Riesling. Um, but for zippy sort of zingy, setting your mouth up for more food or even richer wines later, it's so good to maybe just start out just on its own with Riesling or with hors d'oeuvres, goat cheese goes really well with that. So will the next wine. So I know you didn't tune in to see me taste. So if there's any questions, Rupa, maybe we can answer some. We, we, we could, but there's no questions yet. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, before I came on, I had somebody contact me, Roger did. And Roger said, um, what does FLX stand for? And I, I use it a lot and others in this industry do in this part of the country. Um, FLX stands for Finger Lakes. So I'd listed quite a few Finger Lakes wines. Uh, let's see, um, we, uh, I'm looking over at the ones I have here. So Wagner, Casa Larga, um, Fossum View, Idle Ridge, Montezuma, New Vines, who have I left out? Oh my gosh, I'm gonna feel horrible. So uh, all sorts of great ones. And they just, depending on the sweetness level, they can go with such a diversity of foods. So I see I have a Q&A. Maybe I yeah. have it on my end. Nope, I, two just came in. Okay. So Tito is asking, what does, Good. What does Riesling go with best besides goat cheese? What cool. other suggestions? Yeah, um, Riesling, well, goat cheese is a little tangier. It's a little lower in uh, that fatty, fatty cow's milk cheese. And so that tangy with the tangy goes really well. One of my favorite pairings in a wine and food pairing class is using a triple fruit spread, sort of a jam on top of goat cheese and a water cracker, real simple. Or you could put it on a baguette that would hold a little bit better. Um, I'm a huge Riesling nut. Um, I like sweeter ones with spicy food, curries, and um, it, they can also tame heat. So most people might have a beer with Mexican food. I tend to have Riesling. Um, you can have, oh golly, so many options. Uh, but like I say, I, I'll just drink them on their own. But there's a, a very big difference between dry Rieslings, which are seemingly more reflective of where it's planted, where that vine was uh, growing. And then the more we pick up with a little bit more sugar, we can build up more intensity of the fruit standing out more. That sugar seems to bring it up a little bit more. So I think I like that diversity of Riesling um, compared to some of the others. Um, I also saw how do we compare it to Michigan. Michigan has incredible Rieslings. And it was on my spit bucket list to get out there uh, this summer. And obviously plans change, but I got to get up there. Um, I know quite a few people through wine judging and um, 
Michigan's been on the list. I, I do a lot of wine competitions and Michigan Rieslings have been winning many competitions for years. And then I thought I saw a question about Virginia too. Yeah, yeah. What was that about? So you mentioned Finger Lakes, but what yeah. do you think about upcoming Virginia wines? I love Virginia wines. In fact, v, uh, Virginia begins with a V, Viognier begins with a V. And I was just staring at some Viognier uh, yesterday. It's a white grape that we usually see growing in better, warmer, drier climates than the Finger Lakes. And that, so that's that's a, a big one outside of the Super 7 that I encourage people to try. And it's big in Virginia and Australia um, and also way over in uh, southern parts of France, um, all along there. I just, yeah, Viognier is very, very pretty. In fact, Three Wine Company uh, uses some for theirs too. I'll throw that in there. <laughs> Um, so I want to move on to the next one, the Sauvignon Blanc. And the Sauvignon Blanc that I have in my glass specifically, I just couldn't decide on Riesling which one to go with. Um, there are some Sauvignon Blanc vines planted here in the Finger Lakes. There's some planted on in Long Island. And again, I've had great versions uh, from those two locations, but uh, there is something special about Sauvignon Blanc from California. And Rodney Strong produces one of my favorites. It's their Charlotte's Home Sauvignon Blanc. And with that savage white uh, and these green qualities, I can't help but think about maybe just plain white fish, uh, not grilled, but just um, baked, squeeze a lemon and then a side of asparagus. That there's so much flavor between the two that the acetyl sort of toned down in the Sauvignon Blanc with a squeeze of that lemon. So acid and acid can kind of mellow each other out. And then you're picking up all the greenness. Again, this, my, this grape is my G grape. So I get green qualities uh, with it all the time or G qualities with it. So for this particular one, oh yeah, I got it. Oh no, that's my Chardonnay. I'm glad I could smell the difference, huh? Oh, you can see I'm fancy. I'm, I'm getting hand painted glasses out now from a shower I went to. Okay, can tell them apart. And the Sauvignon Blanc just, it has different floral aspects. One of my favorite wine visits was at the old Fetzer property, um, Northern California. And they had a garden set up that you could walk around and in this garden, they would have maybe a bottle on top of a wood barrel and it would say, smell the Sauvignon Blanc and now pick this lemon verbena. And it was just amazing how much you could smell. And I wasn't familiar with that uh, particular plant before. So lemon verbena, it was like, wow, this is incredible, the similarity. So people that can really nose wines well and pick out all those different uh, components are very skilled and they have probably better food memories than I have. And you don't want me to get into my food memories. And some of my former students will explain why later, but. So, so the questions are coming in now, Lorraine. Okay. <laughs> okay, it, it's fantastic. So uh, we have a question about how do you feel about wines made from other fruits besides grapes? So pears, for example, or cranberry wine. I'd love to know who's asking that or where they're from because it doesn't exist. Well, that, that's what a lot of the certification bodies will tell you that only the finest wines will be made with grapes and that they don't even talk about other fruits or, uh, but if you talk to some of our local wineries, uh, Phil Plummer makes uh, an excellent cranberry uh, bog, Montezuma cranberry bog. I serve it in the class, students love it. And then thinking about that with Thanksgiving meals, it's a natural. So I love fruit wines. I love judging them. Um, apple, pear. I have a lot of students making mead and I'll serve meads in the classes. So honey wines, you usually find the best fruit wines in regions that grow good fruit. So going back to Michigan again, you'll see some wonderful wines. I've had students from Maine that will share with me some blueberry wines, Massachusetts cranberry. So um, I have a retail palette because I spent so many years there and I like everything, <laughs> even bad wine. You're like, here, Lorraine, try it. It's bad. Okay. okay. <laughs> so um, this one's not bad. This Sauvignon Blanc is so pretty. 
and it's got this little spritziness to it that makes it lift up and I want to go back for another sip. Oh my gosh, wait a minute. I, I probably should have a spit cup, huh? So this is not a real strong, what I would say, New Zealand style. Some of you may have had Kim Crawford and other New Zealand styles from Marlboro that will be much more aggressive, sort of uh, uh, capsicum, green bell pepper, uh, green beans. And that's fine. I love that style too. But this is just so pretty. I could see it with um, a lot of different foods. And again, I had mentioned that goat cheese before. So maybe that salad with goat cheese and maybe some sort of a fruit vinaigrette, um, some candied walnuts and craisins. So there's something there that that fruit of the wine can really latch onto. And again, with that dressing, it might be a little creamier, but it also will have that vinegar that can tone down the higher acid that we're seeing with Sauvignon Blanc. So Lorraine, this is going to turn into a mini meeting of your fan club, I think. Uh oh. Yeah, it's great. No, no, no there, compliments. There's no, no. There's no uh oh. So Brianna okay. saying she was going to ask you about Virginia. So thank you for answering that because she had the best Chardonnay down there. Oh and then, yes. Brianne McDonough. She said yeah. she wanted to let you know her class. Okay. Her class was amazing, and she's so happy to hear you again. Move along. Thank you. Move that, along. No, no, I can't. So the, the other question about the cranberry and the pear was from Kelly Redder. And I was going to oh. tell you she's one of our own. But yes, I just she is. So <laughs> anybody else who has fan club type messages to give to Lorraine, please type them <laughs> in. I'll make sure she sees them. That sounds good. That sounds good. Well, Tito, who had asked a question earlier, does a lot of homemade wine. And I encourage you to do that. I, I kid around that. I just, um, I don't think I could ever be a winemaker or, or be in the vineyard or worry about all of those crops and harvests and ah, but on the other hand, uh, somebody like the, the Wagners, uh, Debbie and John and their son Hayden, they've been doing this for generation after generation. And so they have the guts to do it and their wines are just recognized everywhere. So there's, um, I don't even make homemade wine. I, I know that uh, I don't have, the attention span sometimes for that. Uh, I'm doing 20 webinars. <laughs> <laughs> so can me, you go back yeah. to that slide? I don't, I would, I would switch it, but I think it has to be you, Lorraine. Which um, one? The slide with the countries, with w the super seven slide. So we, uh, we have uh, a question about that. Uh-oh, and I'm frozen up here. Uh-oh. And I know I, th I think we're only two wines in, right? Out of seven? Yeah. So, ah, there we go. Is that the one or you wanted me to go back? My screen didn't move. I'm, there we go. Was it this? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah. I'm but he just wanted to capture that, I believe. Okay. So, I wanted to focus because we're, we're featuring alums tonight. Um, certainly I've talked in a couple other webinars about other places around the world where these grapes are planted and grown. Um, but tonight really focusing on the two coasts um, and then moving on now to Chardonnay. So uh, Chardonnay unoaked or naked. <laughs> That's the new wording for a lot of it. If it's unoaked, uh, naked not having anything to do with organic or sustainable or, no, those are separate things, but naked being unoaked styles, uh, those have gained in popularity as people might've gotten a little tired of sort of oaky, smoky, toasty, um, but there's, those are, have different uses. So an unoaked Chardonnay, I might treat somewhat similarly to food I would have Riesling and Sauvignon Blanc with, as opposed to um, a Chardonnay that was a little oakier, creamier, uh, I had a Chardonnay once that I wouldn't typically buy, and it was from California and very, very popular brand, but I, it wasn't exactly my style on its own. And then I had it with a macadamia nut encrusted mahi-mahi with a mango tropical fruit salsa. And it just was one of the best wine and food pairings I ever had. And I had scallops from Long Island with uh, a wine from down there uh, with a vanilla burr blanc sauce. I don't like scallops. I don't like burr blanc sauce and I don't like Cal uh, uh, Chardonnays in general, but I loved it. So 
often we try wines, and this is typical in the US, we often try wines without trying them with food. And so when I went through Europe and I would, I would open my mouth, insert foot, I'd be like, oh, I serve your wine in my class. And they'd say, what do you serve it with? I'm like, um, <laughs> my tongue? Um, gee, uh, sorry. So we can't forget, even if you go to Italy, you'd, you'd maybe have bread and olive oil, uh, cheeses, all of these wonderful things on the side, these little pickies that would go so well with the wines of that area. So Chardonnay, anyone? So this Chardonnay, Three Wine Company, uh, they've been great to RIT. They donated to the Ritz dinner previously. And I got back in touch with them and I'm a big fan of all of their big red blends, old vines, but it, some of it didn't exactly fit the profile for tonight. They do a Chardonnay and I was like, yay. And uh, they'll serve this wine with their paella, which uh, very sausage rich and a little different style. So. Uh, maybe you think of California as only those heavy, rich styles, and this isn't. This is the first time trying it, though, and it, it came in just in time for the tasting. But it's just got this beautiful creaminess. And I usually look for apple. Um, from California, maybe not the green apple, but maybe more yellow apple style. But it's just so pretty. I would, I would imagine a lot of the people tuning in are, are Chardonnay people and uh, different stuff. Wow, that's good. Um, that's got some really pretty spices. Uh, and, and talking about food memories, when I was growing up, uh, I loved custards. And I would uh, have custards that have the nutmeg. So you get that egg and vanilla and that creamy texture. And that's what it's reminding me of. Um, this would be so fun <laughs> with a bunch of friends safely distanced. So Lorraine, are there any old world regions specializing in naked Chardonnays? You had mentioned naked Chardonnays. Yeah, all the way to the left on the bottom of this slide, Chablis. C-H-A Chablis, C-H-A Chardonnay. And it's in a cooler climate right a uh, little southwest of Champagne. And you'll see Chardonnay and Champagne, you'll see Chardonnay and Chablis. But in general, their basic Chablis is an un -oak style. And it might remind some people of a Sauvignon Blanc, a really dry Sauvignon Blanc, but it goes so well with oysters. It, it is just sort of a classic pairing. You open up a, a pairing book uh, from way back when and oysters and Chablis, that would be the classic sort of cocktail wine to get people's appetite going before a nice dinner. Uh, so that would be the typical region. Um, otherwise, you really have to play around with uh, maybe somebody putting on that bottle on oak. So for instance, uh, Wagner has oaked uh, barrel reserves and all these other uh, wines, but this is their unoaked. And it's just delicious. It's really crisp. Um, and again, you wouldn't need food because it's just, just fun and, and flavorful. Boy, I'm not sounding as uh, descriptive tonight. Uh, I guess I'm just ready for wine and food too. But uh, just more of the uh, apple sort of qualities and citrusy. So it gets your attention and that acid is there to, um, yes, it would go with food, but it's definitely a wine you could just have on its own. But you'll see that style around just um, less I don't want to say less popular, but less of it made in that style usually. White Burgundy sort of is in that middle. And White Burgundy is made out of Chardonnay, but it's from the Burgundy region of France, which a lot of people associate with Pinot Noir. This is going to be a good segue. Um, and if that's the, some of the best Chardonnay in the world, that they don't have maybe as much obvious oak as some other regions of the world, maybe warmer climates like California and uh, Australia. So I'm going to punch okay, in. Wait. So before you move on to the reds, there's, sure. there's another there's another fan club. I'm going to I'm going to interrupt with a uh -oh. fan. Club. Okay. <laughs> so Elise Welsh is on. Oh, okay, cool. So she wants to say hi. She said she took all of your classes and she does some yeah. volunteer work with Baruti Wines. Bordy, sorry, Bordy. Bordy Vineyards in yeah. Maryland. Yes. Perhaps I've had a little oh. too much and I'm reading wrong. Oh, cool. I've been there. It's a great place. All right, and then she's asking me. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna say it to you how she spelled it. 
Okay. Because I told you, when I met Lorraine, everyone, I told her I was not able to take her class because every time I tried to register for it as an MBA student, I was going to take it anyway. I, I could never get in. But so she wants to know how long it's going to be before we get you to say terroir. Oh, <laughs> um, come Can we right get up. you to say it today? Coming right up. All right. Excellent. Beautiful. <laughs> Thanks, Elise. Yeah. <laughs> so here we are. Um, there's debate in the wine world about that term terroir. There you go. <laughs> um, but T-E-R-R-O-I-R -R -R refers to the environmental impact on a vine. Um, now, a lot of people would say not just the environment, but the winemaker has a lot to do with it. And it has a lot to do with the fact that we have flying winemakers. We have access to different parts of the world we didn't 200 years ago, where maybe a winemaker in the Finger Lakes says, okay, harvest is done, wines are chugging along. I'm going to head down uh, the latter part of the year and help out with a harvest down in Australia or New Zealand. They don't have enough people to help with some of it. They have a much lower population. So I can gain experience down there, but then that might also influence how they approach wine when they come back. Whereas maybe generation after generation after generation in some of the old world European wineries, it's just always been that way. And some of it by law, some of it a lot less by law in the new world. So terroir, okay, terroir. Um, it Thank you. <laughs> Elise will be happy. Yes, yes. Oh, trust me, it isn't just her. Um, <laughs> It, it, it isn't that our vines are pulling up stones um, and putting them into our little glasses of wine, but there's definitely something to be acknowledged about some of those laws, regulations, and how wines taste from those areas. So I expect certain characteristics from those um, because that's the way it has been. Now, uh, climate changes, don't wanna be political, but there are some changes, at least in temperatures and how wines are being made and what grapes are being planted. So we're gonna see a few changes maybe in a while and sooner than later. But um, one of the biggest uses of that word is usually when we talk about Pinot Noir. And this is my Pinot Noir glass. I don't have quite the right lighting, but it's a little bit more bulbous here. And that allows all of that pretty, pretty uh, red fruit and maybe some of the uh, what I think of as sort of autumn leafy characteristics to come out in the wine. But Pinot Noir is uh, something that people don't always appreciate it because it is a little more delicate. And if anyone saw the movie Sideways, that whole thing was about how different Pinot Noir can be and how different our personalities can be. And that's what this grape sort of does. And um, can be done in a lot of different styles. Uh, warmer climate, riper fruit, more texture, more oak perhaps, or more subtle laid back, even less oak. But there's something about the acidity of it that makes it really good. And Elise, if you're commenting about that, if I say Pinot Noir, you say, well, I don't hear it yet, but I know I'm gonna have comments about mushroom, that there's just something so earthy. Here the comments come. <laughs> If I say mushroom, you should say Pinot Noir because this goes with that sort of earthy uh, umami type richness that we can get with mushrooms. So I'm gonna take a little sip of the Pinot. Comments, anything? So I need some food with that. The acid's really good. Um, I, I love that and I would say it's a little leaner, a little leaner style, uh, cooler climate style that I have from the Finger Lakes. Um, and in fact, I'm, I, I have Fossum View. So uh, that's one of Phil Plummer's also, his wines. And he has such different styles between the three wineries that he works with. So it's really cool. Um, but I wanna move on to Merlot. I don't wanna run out of time to talk about these a little bit. So. Merlot, I have Wagner Merlot in my glass. And no, I'm not against stemless. I've gotten better with it now that we're using plastic cups in our classroom, but I am just so proud of RIT and how we were able to offer my classes because it got really close and dicey a couple of weeks out even uh, that we weren't gonna have water uh, beverages in our room. Uh, we weren't gonna be able to eat food in our room. And they've er erected plastic barriers 
We wear face shields when we taste and eat, uh, when we're not masked and we were able to carry it out. We've been great, uh, no issues. And so I'm very thankful for how our students have acted, how the administration has set us up that we're able to do these courses because I know they're favorites for some of the students and um, I love teaching. So <laughs> that's the way uh, I'm looking at it. So Merlot, my M grape. So the Wag Mer Merlot, and I have next to me Casa Larga Cabernet Merlot. Some of you, especially from New York, are thinking, where's the Cabernet Franc? And it's usually more of a blending grape and not considered as much standalone around the rest of the world. But their Cab Merlot has Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, and the Merlot in it. Um, and I'm going to be finishing up with that uh, Rodney Strong Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, I've got new vines. I've got Hazlitt Schooner Red. I've got too many wines here for this uh, time period, but I'm not going to drink them all, okay? But Merlot, it's just pretty. It's, it's, uh, plum, cherry. Oh my, a lot of cherry. Wow, that's really good. Um, it has a real good, strong tartness. And it makes me want to try it with, if anyone's seen those fruit Stiltons, uh, that would be really good. Or some, uh, just some, I, I have pizza out there. Uh, I know it sounds silly, but it's got ricotta and eggplant. And I know I'm going to try this with that after I'm done here, because I like the tartness of that uh, tomato sauce with the acid here. And Merlot seems to go with a lot of different things. I see Merlot in Italian restaurants with sauces. Um, one of the traditional ones might be more lamb. I know, <laughs> but I had to go for it. Uh, so Lorraine, I have a question that um, Jenny is asking, but I've always wondered this myself too. So how do you pick out specific elements of aroma in a, in a wine? So I will also, and Jenny, Jenny's saying this, but I completely agree with her read um, the description of what a wine says and I taste it and I can't taste any of those. Okay. Yeah, um, you have to be careful of labels. Some people love to put labels uh, with descriptions and food pairings on them. Other people avoid it like the plague because what if you add one too many ingredients to the description on the back? So what if I said a macadamia nut encrusted mahi mahi with a mango salsa and you say, oh, I don't like fish. Oh, uh, well, maybe you shouldn't buy that wine, but no, it'll still go with other things. So when I'm smelling things, sometimes the marketing department might not talk to the winemaker. Um, there can be a disconnect or uh, some people will nail it, but that's why I do say you can train your brain. You can go and work at it. And that's what I had to do for certifications. I had to be able to decide what these wines were blind. I would uh, have to be able to describe them. I have to be able to pick apart what makes some of them different. And so that's why I like these slides. I think these are a good basis uh, for working on things yourself. And then you can read up more on certain grapes and try different grapes and say, oh, wait a minute, this is different because, uh, and do a comparison. I, I very rarely would have just wine, one wine on the table. Um, no, I mean, not me on the table. I'd rarely just be drinking one wine in a glass on that table. I would probably have a couple so that I can compare them uh, because that's what you know I like to do and I can learn better by doing that comparison. Uh, anyone drinking Merlot? I'm curious. Sometimes it's ignored but Syrah um, people have asked me a lot what would be your sort of can't live without wine and I would have to be Riesling but for red it's probably Syrah. I've really started to nail down Syrah, Grenache, uh, blends in particular. And I think that's why I like uh, some of the wines that Southern France or California, Australia, but uh, back to my alums. So uh, my Syrah, I didn't, I didn't buy a Syrah. I have the uh, three wine company one out there and a few others, but not the alums, but Syrah can have this deep, deep color. And I think a lot of you have had Australian Shiraz um, but maybe I should move on then to Cabernet Sauvignon. So Lorraine, do you, it, do you think it's safe to say that Merlot is the gateway wine for red wine? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's definitely the gateway wine. Um, 
not Pinot Noir. Uh, and Cabernet Sauvignon can just be too big and rich, especially just trying it on its own. Merlot is that sort of happy medium, my medium M grape. So oh, let's see, well, what glass? Oh, I'll, I'll, eh, I didn't bring in my Cabernet Sauvignon glass, so I'll go that route. But it's definitely the darkest of all three of the reds uh, after the Pinot Noir. Uh, it's got a lot of color to it. And it does, it smells uh, much oakier. Sometimes as these wines age, they can smell more like cedar. Um, and the Cabernet Sauvignon can be uh, softening over time. So this is because of its high acid and high tannin, whoopsie, um, you will see that um, those will age so much better. And these are the ones you'll hear people talk about collecting. And Emma Siegel uh, is out at a tasting room in Napa Valley and gets to work with these wines that are very, very limited. Uh, Ryan Evans works at a winery where their wines are very, very limited. Um, Jenny Keller, um, I've never pronounced your name publicly. Uh, last, your, your married name publicly, so I'm not gonna try it now, Jenny but uh, she works at Rodney Strong and they have these reserves and larger formats. And these are wines that are built to age. They're not meant to be wines that you should consume within the first couple of years of their lives. They're wines that collectors or people that are willing to wait for that tannin to soften and have all of these other flavors uh, come out of, that's what you're re rewarded with with your patience. So those types of wines, um, we have a tendency to drink some of our wines a little too young. Uh, we also have a tendency to drink some of our wines too old, you know, like wine goes bad. Yeah, wine can go bad. So we have to be careful, but the general style these days in that sort of eight to $15 price range, wineries are making wines you can drink now. Oh, isn't that a novel idea? Um, it used to be that, oh, the longer a wine could age, it'd be considered better. And now we, we get it. We know that wines are being consumed more uh, frequently with less time of aging. You know, like tick, tick, tick. When are you buying your wine from the store and drinking it? Uh, when I get home? And that's sort of the style that people are recognizing now. I'm going to take a sip of Cabernet Sauvignon. I'm going to let that open up a little bit overnight and go back to it tomorrow and have that with uh, uh, probably not vegetables. It's not a vegetarian's uh, Cabernet Sauvignon necessarily until we're talking maybe a rich, a richer sauce and baked and grilled and all those other fun things, which we can do. But it depends on what you're looking for. Uh, Pinot Noir might be more what vegetarians uh, look for and Cabernet Sauvignon the other extreme, but nothing wrong with any of them. Questions? Oh, there's a few. Yeah, there are. So what's your okay. favorite Cabernet Sauvignon? My favorite? I'm not going to give favorites. It, I mean, it really depends what I'm eating and yeah, who's with me. Anything else though? I don't know if we're going to go right up to eight, but I want to uh, answer things like I say now and uh, certainly can get back in touch with so many of you. Who... How about aerating wines? Aerating, okay. Is that so really necessary? Um, if you pour it in your glass about 10 minutes ahead of time, that's probably going to do the trick. There's something special and sexy about uh, uh, using a decanter, maybe. Not that a lot of us have one. Use a clean vase. Uh, take the flowers out first. But it, it is something that if you have a wine that you're opening up before its ideal time, uh, where it could really show all that it has to offer, yeah, use a decanter and swirl it around. If you don't want to pour the glasses out ahead of time, 10, 15 minutes or more, use a decanter an hour ahead of time and uh, enjoy it then because it will soften up the tannins. So it definitely will change the wine. I have some people that swear they'll decant everything, including their $8 bottles. And it, it will change it because air changes things. Something else? So what about wines being too old? Oh, yeah. Um, ideally storing wines, you want somewhere cool, pretty consistent temperature and dark. Uh, so the lower 
um, drawer of your dresser at, at RIT, that works. Uh, well, maybe not the best, but <laughs> for a lot of students store their wines for aging. Um, sellers are usually pretty good. Um, you really don't forget about wines, okay? So um, I, have, I have an issue because I have wine in my cellar. I don't have a wine cellar. And so sometimes I go down and I've been pleasantly surprised that a 10 year old bottle of uh, Merlot from Washington State or something is still really tasty. So it was good to start out, but it might not be as good as it would have been four years earlier. So don't throw them out unless you can't drink it. Maybe you can marinate some uh, something in it. Anything else? Let's see, what do you do with all the yucky sediment that's in old red wines? Oh, that's a good, oh, that's the best reason to decant. Um, a lot of people will decant wines to soften them up and they forget about sediment that comes with aging. And again, if we're not hanging onto our wines long, we're not staying in one place uh, very long anymore and we're moving around for jobs and things. Uh, a lot of us don't have cellars, but uh, if you have sediment in the bottle, if you've been storing the wine properly, you know there's gonna be sediment in that bottle, especially if it says unfined and unfiltered, uh, or you see some that says it will throw a sediment or deposit, then ideally you wanna set it up a little bit about a, head, uh, a day ahead and get as much of that sediment into the bottom area of that bottle. And then very, very carefully, perhaps even with a flashlight or a candle over the, under the neck, pour that out until you see some of that sediment come up because it's just gritty. You don't want it in your glasses. Uh, and I know a friend who would go to tastings and they'd always get sludged. They were, they were always the last one in the spot around the table and they always got the sediment. So you don't want that to be your guess. So something you did not uh, discuss tonight, but um, we have a question about dessert wines. Oh yeah. And, and what the appropriate serving size is because the bottles are so much smaller. Usually about two ounces. So with a regular bottle, if you did four ounces, a serving, uh, about two ounces because it's usually more intense. It might even be more alcoholic. So you want to um, just serve a little. So out of a half bottle, you can get you know about six servings, six two ounce servings, or um, if you wanted to serve a little bit more or have somebody go back and get a little bit later if they really liked it, but just start out with about two ounces of something like that. Late harvest Chardonnays, you could do Riesling ice, as I mentioned before. There's ports and sherries and everything all over our coasts. Something else. Well, let's See. Oh, you're trying to decide. I see it. I, I well, there's a lot. It's fantastic. I know, I know. I know. Um, so so actually we had two questions about this. How the same grape can taste different depending on if the skins were left on or how it was stored. Mm -hmm. It's interesting whether it's an oak or steel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's so that's not really a question. It's that was yeah. more of a statement, but we did. <laughs> Any thoughts yeah. on that, I should say. <laughs> well, that's why I say uh, maybe being a winemaker isn't quite for me because whew, there's so many choices. And you get Phil Plummer talking. God bless him. I've been listening to some of his great virtual tastings. And he'll talk about all the different yeast he's using. Who knew, right? I just thought it was yeast. Well, there's ambient yeast. There's yeast that he's got from here, there, and everywhere. Um, and so that changes everything too. There's so many variables into winemaking. So that's why I really appreciate all of our alums that are in this industry that are able to uh, come up with these wines and promote these wines or whatever their involvement is with uh, these wineries. It's just phenomenal. I mean, I, I love the industry. So I can see where if I got, the bug, got bit by the bug, they might be also. Uh, it's just a great industry to be in. Um, so do you have any idea of uh, startup costs for homemade no. wine basic supplies? Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. I thought it was going to be a winery. No. Um, yeah, you're like, no. <laughs> yeah. Homemade wine, uh, there's a lot of uh, options. And uh, uh, I don't know if they're local, but uh, locally, 
if you want to go and just sort of really start out, there's actually RIT um, retired teachers, and I think the name is Wine Works, um, and you can make wine on premise. Tara Beltrami, who's uh, helping Phil uh, Plummer out at Montezuma with their harvest, and he's making over 100 different wines for the three wineries. Uh, he, the Wine Works, uh, Tara made wine with them, but uh, they are right down in the public market and, and they would be easy to provide great info. Uh, there's a lot of uh, wine kit places around in all areas of the country and it's big in Canada. Um, so there's a lot of places you can start out and I'd be happy to recommend if you wanna contact me directly, uh, what places you might try, but just even trying a kit first and then trying variations on it. That's some of the stuff we've done in our classes. We'll just try a kit and then um, once it's bottled, you can see how it lasts, doesn't always last long, and then venture out and do something else. So a lot of options for home winemaking. I, I'm laughing out loud and it was not because of what you were saying. It's because oh. of probably one of the best comments I've read. <laughs> so I'm going to have to ask you this. Okay. So, Wanya Jefferson first Says, says she's sending much love to you. And I also want to know this, Wanya, so thank you for asking, uh, what do we drink Thursday night for the debate? Uh, heavily? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> whatever is going to make you feel good. Uh, yeah, uh, that that's a good one. Uh, there is a Trump winery, but I'm, you know, that would be up to you. Uh, they're down in Virginia, so it might be a little tough to get it. Actually, I've seen some sold locally. But um, other than that, I haven't seen any Biden wines. Um, you can certainly look up, boy, it's easy to do nowadays, what businesses support certain candidates and maybe choose a wine for those reasons. But uh, I assume so if it's tongue in cheek and wine in cheek, yeah, I know you'll choose the right one. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have any thoughts, Lorraine, on what actually determines the price of wine? Oh, oh, that's tough. Uh, we're, we're seeing some interesting times with some tariffs uh, and luxury item taxes and uh, availability issues. And we're also seeing incredible competition too. So we're seeing wine regions that have never been uh, very important maybe in the wine world, but having access now. So there's a lot of good competition. On the other hand, I, 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 I've, I've got to be hurting for some of these wineries that have had issues with wildfires and COVID-19 regulations. Uh, pricing of wine, I, I know that <laughs> personally, I might have started consuming a little more than the average uh, when all of this started, but I also know that I wanted to support local. I wanted to support um, even if I wasn't going out to a restaurant or taking food to go. I want to support some of my local restaurants. We've got some that have wonderful alum relations as well. Um, that cost and value, um, almost going back to a debate maybe. Uh, I'm willing to pay more for certain things if it stands for something. So there's some wacky pricing going on and um, some of it good, some of it bad. So I, I think, yeah, that's too broad. A, a, sorry, I'm gonna go a little wild with trying to get that answered uh, properly, but um, I might have to move on to another one and answer that offline. <laughs> Fair enough. So Todd Ikes is saying wonderful presentation. Oh. He appreciates this. And he wanted to share that New Vines Winery is one of the smallest farm wineries in the Finger Lakes and the annual and, production of 300 cases and a special thank you for tasting their Riesling. Well, and I hope he gets to open the B&B &B soon because he has been wonderful to so many people. He's an ambassador for the Finger Lakes and uh, then not, not with just his wine, but having so many relationships to the other wineries nearby too. So thank you, Todd. So, so let's see. It, it's 8.04, Lorraine, yeah. you want to still go? Because there's there, there are still a few more questions. I can take questions. a couple more questions, sure. And then my dogs and family return. So okay, uh, change the vibe. How about Coravin? Yeah. Does it really work? Yes, it does work. 
Yeah, it really does work, but I'm not sure how many people want to invest $200 in something that uh, is sort of sitting on one bottle or two or whatever. So that's a big investment. And um, I just talked to my students today about bubble savers for the tops of uh, sparkling wines and champagne. And the cost of the thing itself is maybe $10 and it preserves bubbles. But um, when I first started doing community classes, people were asking, well, how do I preserve the bubble? I'm the only one in the household that drinks bubbles. And so I showed them the bubble saver and I started teaching at RIT. And I said, so what do you do with leftover wine? Well, here's a bubble saver that'll protect the bubbles. And I look up and my students are looking at me like, Left, leftover wine, Left, leftovers, huh? I, I don't know what she's talking about. Um, so it, it was different audience. And so the same thing that uh, you can get uh, preservers, um, the canisters or uh, pumps, you know, it can preserve it some. The Coravins are by far the best uh, out there right now. Sommeliers swear by them because it cuts down on their overall cost if they're going for certifications. I can make a bottle last for however long I need it to last and only take uh, a few ounces at a time maybe for a, a blind tasting and sharing with friends. It's also used at a lot of the library wines uh, at wineries now. So it's changing our industry about your being able to try things at wineries and uh, very limited supply things that uh, they wouldn't have been able to preserve before without it. So let's see, we, we've got some regional questions. Okay, um, so. and here comes my family. Okay, last question. Okay, last question. So area is um, Research Triangle Park in, near Raleigh, oh, yeah. Vermont. Yeah. Uh, any thoughts on wines from those areas? It gets tougher when you get up to Vermont. Uh, that's certainly where we see a lot of Minnesota varieties, uh, hybrids created uh, uh, in Minnesota. Um, we see that up in our Thousand Islands area, the North Country here as well. Um, I've had some great apple wines from there, some of my favorites, uh, but they are seeing some success with some of those Minnesota varieties. Too cold for, at this point, for any sustained uh, production with some of the vinifera of the Super 7 we sort of see tonight. Um, and then down in North Carolina, you can find a lot of sweeter wines like we might have in the Finger Lakes that are very grapey using Scuppernong and um, what's my other biggie? Uh oh, I'm blanking. Uh, but you'll see a lot of uh, fruity wines, but they can also in certain areas be planting uh, some of these bigger red grapes and doing very well, Chardonnay as well. Uh, so you can't rule out uh, North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland. Um, by the time you get to South Carolina, then down into Florida, You'll see pockets of some of these Super 7, but you'll also see a lot of the um, more grapey, regional grapey type uh, local grapes used. And uh, so it depends what your palate is. I'm not saying that uh, Catawba, Niagara, and Concord are bad. I'm just saying if we're comparing to the Super 7, those are going to be easier drinking and real fun. Uh, almost any time wines. Uh, I'd be remiss if I couldn't set up for a Hazlitt Red Cat then uh for those people but um it's uh there are vineyards in all 50 states and wineries in all 50 states well lorraine thank you so much for sharing oh my gosh, thank you with our alumni and friends today and thank you at home for joining us as i mentioned earlier we will send out information on how to access the recording in the near future also don't forget to make your war day gift donation um, using the link in the chat box and lastly, if you're not already connected to the RIT Alumni Association social media channels, we encourage you to do so. The links can also be found in the chat box. Thank you again for joining us and enjoy the rest of Tiger Alumni Week. Yay, roar. Okay, bye.